Hey everyone, Firefly 404, Andrew here. And I'm actually filming this on my birthday, but that's kind of irrelevant. On Facebook, I tend to have friends of varying face from varying realms of my life. Be they co-workers, be they family, be they people I've met online. And I don't always agree with a lot of them. In fact, I sometimes vehemently disagree with a lot of them, especially if it's family and co-workers. Friends I usually tend to get along with, even if some of them disagree from time to time. But in particular, with regards to yes, eh, sorry, not yesterday's, Friday's ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court, one of my friends posted a link to an article on Christianity Today. It's entitled, Here We Stand, An Evangelical Declaration on Marriage. And I thought, you know, just for a bit of practice, because I haven't made videos for a while, and I apologize, I would actually go through this and respond to it. I'm going to leave a link to the actual article below. You can read it if you want. I'm just going to read the parts that are highlighted in bold on the article itself. Three pages, although most of the last two pages are just signatures, I'm not going to bother touching most of those. Okay, here we go. As evangelical Christians, we dissent from the court's ruling that redefines marriage. I'm going to get back to that. The Bible clearly teaches the enduring truth that marriage consists of one man and one woman. Odd, when I read the Bible, I seem to recall that several of the very prominent figures in that Bible, who were of the Jewish faith, had multiple wives, even concubines. King David, I believe, had eight wives and several concubines. You want to include that in your definition of marriage? Evangelical churches must be faithful to the biblical witness on marriage, regardless of the cultural shift. And then the gospel must inform our approach to public witness. I'm going to tie those two into the first one of, as evangelical Christians, we dissent from the court's ruling that redefines marriage. Let me quote from the ruling itself. It must be emphasized that religions and those who adhere to religious doctrines may continue to advocate with utmost sincere conviction that, by divine precepts, same-sex marriage should not be condoned. The First Amendment ensures that religious organizations and persons are given proper protection as they seek to teach the principles that are so fulfilling and so central to their lives and faiths, and to their own deep aspirations to continue the family structure they have long revered. The same is true of those who oppose same-sex marriage for other reasons. In turn, those who believe allowing same-sex marriage is proper or indeed essential, whether as a matter of religious conviction or secular belief, may engage those who disagree with their view in an open and searching debate. The Constitution, however, does not permit the state to bar same-sex couples from marriage on the same terms as accorded to couples of the opposite sex. Justice Kennedy, Majority Opinion. End quote, obviously. But. So, returning to the subject at hand, you and your church can keep your definition of marriage exactly how you want. Just like I believe it's the Catholic Church doesn't recognize divorcees and will not marry divorcees, you don't want to marry people who are Gay? You don't have to. That's what the First Amendment's there for. Now, are you actually saying that people of other faiths who would perform those ceremonies shouldn't be allowed to perform them? You see, that's where you start stepping on religious liberty. You're saying that that religion cannot perform their ceremony, or that that secular ceremony cannot proceed. You're trying to impose your religion on that religion and that secularism. That's where we have a problem. The state has to recognize any couple that wants to declare that this person 
is the most important person in my life, and I want to spend the rest of my life with this person. That is what marriage is. Which brings me to the next point in this article. The redefinition of marriage should not entail the erosion of religious liberty. Well, for one, it's not. It doesn't. If anything, it says, hey, you religions that could not perform these sermons, you can perform them now. That's not an erosion of religious liberty. That's an expansion of it. Just like, it's not a redefinition of marriage. It's an expansion of the meaning. Two people, two consenting adults, can say, this person is the most important person to me. You see, by saying just people, two people, two consenting adults, that also includes two consenting opposite-sex adults. How is that a redefinition? If you redefine it, it would mean something completely different. Saying, okay, it means just a little bit more now. That's just expanding the definition. That's not a redefinition. Redefinition would be like saying red is now blue. That is not what is happening here. Okay, through page one finally, let's go to page two. The gospel of Jesus Christ determines the shape and tone of our ministry. Okay, that just ties into the same thing as before. You can continue to not perform same-sex marriages. The Constitution says you don't want to perform them because it's not part of your doctrine? You don't have to. We're not going to force you to. <sighs> okay, after that, it's just the list of pastors who signed this. So, I'm done now. However, I want to leave you with a little clip. This is from the 1980s from a little show called Golden Girls. Enjoy. It's easier for you to say that, Sophia. It's not your brother who's getting married to a man. Oh, look, I can accept the fact that he's gay, but why does he have to slip a ring on this guy's finger so the whole world will know? Why did you marry George? We loved each other. We wanted to make a lifetime commitment, wanted everybody to know. That's what Doug and Clayton want, too. Everyone wants someone to grow old with, and shouldn't everyone have that chance? 